One of the basic principles in the Buddha's teachings is that you're trying to make the best use of what you've got. So as you sit here with your eyes closed, what have you got? You've got the body sitting here breathing, and you've got the mind thinking and aware. So you bring them together. There are all kinds of things you could do with this body sitting here breathing and the mind thinking and aware. You could think about the past, you could think about the future, you can give rise to greed, aversion, and delusion. Or you can turn them into concentration. Take the body as the object of your meditation. Use the breath to create feelings of ease, feelings of comfort. Think about the breath, that's sanya, or perception. Direct your thoughts and your evaluation to the breath. Direct a thought and evaluation of sankaras. And be conscious of what you're doing. In other words, you take these five khandhas, these five aggregates that you've got sitting here, and you put them to good use. You turn them in from, turn them away from being piles of you or yours, things to wear you down, and you turn them into the path. This is a very basic principle in the teaching. Because all too often we take these things and we try to make a sense of self out of them. You identify with your thoughts, you identify with your feelings, you identify with your body. And as you identify them, with them, you cling to them, hold on to them, and they turn into piles. That's one of the me meanings of the word pakanda. Piles, bundles, things that you carry around on top of your shoulders. And what do you get out of them? They just wear you down, burden you down. The more you cling to them, the more you suffer. They're not at fault. It's your clinging that's at fault. They in and themselves are perfectly fine. If you were to ask the body, do you want to stay alive? The body's indifferent. If you're asking feelings, would you rather be pleasant or pain? If the feelings are indifferent, they could be anything at all. And so on down with all the other contents. It's our wants and desires that say that this has to be like that, that has to be like this. And do those things follow our wishes? They follow them to some extent. But ultimately, they're not totally under our control. And this is what gives Christ rise to the suffering and pain we suffer as we keep grabbing after them. And when you look at the kindness, they're not things, they're functions. They're activities. Even the body, which is the closest to them to being a thing. When you look at it very carefully, there's just a lot of activity going on in there. These properties of earth, water, fire, and wind. and what they do. They function. They're not just solid lumps sitting here. They move. They change. Even more so with the metal aggregates, constantly changing all the time, functioning this way, functioning that way. And the images the Buddha gives for them are like mirages, bubbles, things with no real substance to them. So just as you try to grab onto them, they slip between your fingers. So we keep grabbing, grabbing, grabbing. A thought arises, a feeling arises. We keep trying to grab onto it, and it's gone, gone. It's just slipped through our fingers. So the question is, what are you going to do with these functions? There's an interesting spot where the Buddha talks about the, the functions of the different khandhas, and one of them, fabrication, is the most basic. Because he says that our experience of all the khandhas depends on fabrication. There's a potential for form, there's a potential for feeling, for perceptions, for fabrication, for consciousness. But for the actual experience of these things to happen, you have to fabricate them a little bit more. Which means that there's an intentional aspect to all your experience. Whatever your experience has to have a certain amount of intention here in the present moment, otherwise there wouldn't be the experience. And it's this fact which opens the way for the path. You can, you can change the way you intend to experience these things. You can turn them into piles of self that are weighing you down, and you can turn them into a path. It's like taking those piles of cement or sand or bricks or whatever you've got on your shoulders, and you put them down, and you make pavement so you can walk on them. Make a path to the unfabricated. 
So that's what we do as we meditate. We change our intention towards the khandhas. Instead of saying, I'm going to grab onto this as me or this as mine, you're going to say, I'm going to try to make this into a path. You start out with simple things like the breath, which is a part of the, the form aggregate. You say, I can make this a, an object for concentration rather than an object for self-identification. There still may be some clinging there, but it's not nearly as strong or as, as harmful. As when you just sit there and say, I want this to be me, and I want this, this to be me, I want this to be mine. Because once it's me or mine, you say, I want this body to stay young. I want it to stay healthy. I want it to stay like this, stay like that. And it doesn't stay. It keeps changing. So instead of fighting the changing, you make use of it. Okay, The breath is the change of the body. It's happening all the time. So you focus on that. So I'm going to make this a path, make this an object of right concentration. That changes your intentionality towards the body. And the same with feelings as they rise. When you're working on concentration, your intention is just let them go, let them pass. Don't get involved with them. Working, when you're working with insight, you want to look at them a little bit more deeply. But you've got to base that insight practice on good, solid concentration. Otherwise, you just start getting entangled, and soon you find yourself getting back with your old intentions. It's like an addiction. You have to be really careful about the things you were used to be addicted to. So in the very beginning, you're trying to just let the feelings pass, let the thoughts pass. Then when your concentration is strong enough, then you can look at them and have a little bit more trust in your intentionality. What are your intentions toward these feelings? Well, you want to observe them to gain insight. Insight into where your attachments are, where your craving is, where your clinging is. So it's the fact that our present experience has to have an element of intentionality. That's what opens the path. So we can turn these khandhas, which are the basic raw materials we've got, and turn them into something useful rather than turning them into a burden. So try to look at all the things you tend to identify with and realize that that identification is not something that comes as a given in the khandhas. They don't come labeled me or mine, my feeling, my emotions, my... The label's not there. You're the one who pastes the label on. Once you paste the label on, then you've got trouble. But if you realize they come just as potentials, and you can turn them either into a pile of bricks on your shoulders, or you can turn them into brick pavement under your feet. That's your choice. And as you practice, you take the latter choice. until you reach the point where you don't need the path anymore. Until that point, there's still a lot to be done, though. When the Buddha talks about using the khandhas as part of the path, there are basically three stages. One is like what we just said, turn them into a path for concentration. Like with the body here, the breath is the object of the concentration. You're trying to develop feelings of pleasure. You have the perception of the breath, perceiving the whole body as part of the breath energy. The fabrication of directed thought and evaluation, and then the consciousness that follows along with these things. That's step one. Step two is to, once the concentration is good and strong, you look at it to see that even in this very subtle concentration there are still problems. There's still some suffering, there's still some clinging. And so you analyze the concentration into the aggregates again. And you work at perceiving these things as not self. Stressful, not self, changing all the time. These are perceptions. And how you develop these perceptions? The Buddha gives an example. He says you start asking questions about them. This form that I'm so attached to, is, this, is it constant or inconstant? We look at it and see it changes. And things that are inconstant, are they stressful or pleasant? We see the stress involved in them as you try to cling to them. And things that are stressful and inconstant, is it really appropriate to say, this is me, this is mine, this is myself? Well, no. I mean, you can ask this question on an ordinary level, and it just doesn't do anything much, or it has temporary help. But as you get deeper, deeper levels of concentration, and look at the places where you're attached, where there still is some very subtle suffering, subtle stress, even in those states of concentration that you really, really like, the realization of that self goes a lot deeper. 
the sense of dispassion, the sense of disenchantment with the whole thing goes a lot deeper. It enables you to let go. Okay, this process of questioning, that's fabrication, the fabrication of appropriate attention. So you learn to ask these questions, you learn to develop these perceptions. Again, they're part of the path, but still they're conduits themselves. The final break is when you incline the mind of the deathless to the unfabricated. And again, you're using perceptions to remind yourself, okay, there is an escape. If you don't remind yourself of this escape, that contemplation of not self and stress and inconstant can get, get, get pretty depressing. But you've got to remind yourself there is a way out. So you use your perceptions to incline the mind towards the way out. And then when you hit it, okay, then you can let go of all the khandhas. That's when you use the khandhas for their best purpose. So there's three stages in taking these burdens that you tend to weigh you down and turn them into a path until you can take off. It's like turning them into a runway. You finally take off, you don't need a path anymore. They say that people who are fully enlightened, so their path is like the path of birds through space, can't be traced. You can talk about the path leading up to awakening, but beyond that point there's no path at all. You're totally free. Remember thinking about this at you know, John Swatt's funeral. The morning after the creation they had this tiny little table set up next to the crematorium. And on it was this little pile of bones covered with cloth. About a foot long, half a foot wide, just a few inches tall. And that was it. That was all that was left of his body. Pope kept thinking about how he had used his body as opposed to how other people used their body. He had taken these khandhas and he put them to good use. There was no sense of sorrow, no sense of loss, just a sense of a job well done, the work completed. So think about your body. What, are you, what use are you going to get out of it in this lifetime? Just use it to create more suffering for yourself, develop more unskillful habits? Or are you going to use it as a path to, to liberation? So that when you finally leave it, okay, you can leave it with your job done. That's the choice that faces all of us. It's a question of how you're going to dedicate your life. Which use of the body, which use of feelings and all the other aggregates you find most inspiring. And then ask yourself, okay, what's getting in the way of your using it for that inspiring purpose? And then find your way around those obstacles. And there's no better use for your body, no better use for your feelings, perceptions, thought fabrications, and consciousness. No better use than this.